Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much for that. It's always a pleasure to be here and to give uh, uh, presentations. It's almost like being home now. I've been so often uh, visiting. Uh, yes, indeed. I'm going to talk about something that is sort of new uh, in my career, but it, it will be uh, something that um, I, will, I will talk about. So it's a combination of expertise. We started to collaborate uh, with a cosmologist uh, in the University of Turku. Uh, and uh, my background is more open quantum systems, so I will give an open quantum system and quantum optics approach to this problem, and he has been contributed more uh, for the, um, let's say, relativistic part. Uh, and um, actually the person who did most of the calculations, as always, is the PhD student that we have in common, so we co-supervise a PhD student. Um, that is uh, uh, Boris Sokolov. And this is the title, and of course, a little bit of a funny title, but as a matter of fact, what we are trying to uh, explain is uh, in which way the size of a cut state could be um, or is uh, relevant in the time of decoherence. I will try to explain better uh, what, I, what I mean um, during the presentation. Uh, and all this work has been. Um, 
um, has been summarized in an article that is uh, in the archive and uh, currently uh, under uh, referring process. So everything I will say basically uh, is in this paper. Uh, and as I say, that this is collaboration between my group within the Turku Center of Quantum Technology and the Cosmology and Field Theory uh, group of uh, Irovilia. Uh, and as I said, again, this is one of the people of my group and Boris was the main leading force for that. So, decoherence, when we think of decoherence, I think that the first thing that comes to mind, not only of physicists, but actually even of the popular uh, audience somehow, is something that has to do with a cut in a box. Uh, and indeed, I will be talking about the super simplified one of the uh, prototypes somehow uh, of this system. Uh, and in particular, um, what I'm going to talk about is just a quantum superposition uh, of two coherent states with opposite phase. So at this stage, we don't even have entanglement with the qubit. It's just a quantum superposition of two coherent states uh, located in two opposite parts of uh, phase space. Uh, and we, will, we are going to describe this using uh, Wigner function formalism, or actually using the quasi-probability distribution uh, functions. So um, I will generally introduce the quasi-probability distribution in this way. And Probably most of you having a quantum optics background know that they are very, very often used in quantum optics. They are connected to the uh, characteristic functions. And here, I use this parameter S. S can be minus 1, 0, or 1, depending on the class of uh, functions. In particular, the Wigner function is uh, uh, corresponding to S equal to uh, 0 here uh, in this formalism. And here we have the D of Xi here. Of course, the rho is the uh, density matrix and uh, D of uh, Xi is the displacement operator for coherent states. So very briefly, this is the type of object that we will be using uh, for describing the time evolution, because this is what we are interested in, really, uh, of uh, the cut state. And just to mention that this, this type of uh, uh, descriptions actually have been already um, realized in more than one experiment. And this is um, um, a picture taken from the uh, 2008 Nature paper in the group of Serge Arosh, in which they reconstructed the Wigner function of a cut state um, of exactly of the type I, I mentioned before, as alpha plus minus alpha. So this is the Wigner function in phase space with real and imaginary um, part of, the, um, of, of alpha. Uh, and um, you see here these two peaks uh, describing the um, two components um, located in the opposite points of the phase space and the interference fringe in the middle. And they actually not only uh, reconstructed uh, the Wigner function itself of the cut state, but also observed the transition from a quantum superposition signaled by the fact that I have these interference uh, fringes here to the classical statistical mixture, uh, which ideally would have no interference fringe and would be just two Gaussian, um, Gaussian functions here. But of course, this is a real experiment, so you still observe some little bit of fluctuations. Just to say that these things are commonly done in the experiments, commonly, but they have been done in experiments, um, and they have been observed in experiments. Uh, and the way in which we understand nowadays the coherence uh, is in terms of the interaction between the quantum system in this case, the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is my, my uh, main um, system, open system, and the rest of the world, that is the environment. And because of this coupling between system and environment, we observe, observe transition from quantum um, superposition to a statistical mixture. But now the question we, ha we ask here is a little bit different. Okay? We were not the first to ask this question. I will discuss briefly also where the idea came from and what we added to this. Uh, this discussion. But the question is, okay, we understand environment-induced decoherence in terms of an environment coupled to the system, but imagine there is no environment. Can actually gravity itself be a source of decoherence? Okay, so this, this is the question that motivated initially uh, the work uh, I, will, I will describe. And the outline, outline is very simple. What is known, the main paper um, that led to this idea, an investigation, what we did, how we continued the investigation and the other questions we asked uh, to complement their work. Then the issue of the size, because remember, normally when one thinks in terms of uh, environment-induced decoherence, 
it is known that the reason why, or it is known, it is said that the reason why we actually do not observe real macroscopic superpositions of macroscopically distinguishable objects is because the bigger is the superposition, okay, the faster is the decoherence induced by the environment. So it's more and more difficult to observe um, non-classical states of bigger size. And I will have to define what size is uh, in a moment. Okay. And then perhaps if I have time, I will discuss a little bit about our future projects related to that. Okay, but let's begin with what is known. So th this is the paper that actually uh, began uh, our interest uh, and, and investigation uh, on this topic. It's a paper uh, published in, in uh, 2015 uh, in the group of uh, Chasnat uh, Bruckner. The title is Universal Decoherence Due to Gravitational Time Dilation. And the idea there, very briefly, I will give you mostly um, a little bit of a motivation uh, of, uh, of uh, physical the physical phenomenon, actually, okay, which, which is behind what happens here. The physical phenomenon is the following. First of all, remember, as I said before here, there is no environment in terms of, I don't know, electromagnetic modes of the, of, of the field, no. Here, what you have is a composite system. The open quantum system is one of the degrees of freedom. Imagine it as a complex molecule. So the, the um, open quantum system is the degree of freedom of the center of mass. Motion. So, is that this is this is what we call what we define the open system. It's the center of mass of the molecule, and what plays the role of an environment are all the internal degrees of freedom, which are described in terms of the vibrational modes of all the atoms composing the molecule. Okay? So, effectively, we have a degree of freedom which is the center of mass motion, and many other degrees of freedom described in terms of quantized harmonic oscillators, the modes of vibration of the molecules composing the, the, uh, of the atoms composing the molecules, sorry. And what, the, uh, what they say is that, well, let's take an object of this type, and let's use the open quantum system formalism to describe the behavior of the center of mass when it interacts with these internal degrees of freedom. And here is the key point, the interaction comes because of gravity. Okay? I will describe it better in a moment. But the initial state that they consider so, is the situation in which you take one of these molecules and you put it at two, in a superposition of two position eigenstates. This is the center of mass. It's a superposition of two different position eigenstates in the vertical direction um, with respect to Earth. So we have two different, as we will see in a moment, um, time dilation. We, we, we play a role, I will mean, not say it here. But in, the important thing is that you have a delta x, a separation in the vertical direction. Okay. And of course, uh, what happens is that, as we all know, uh, that clocks tick slower closer to a massive object, the time is seen by one of the components, say that this is x1, of the superposition, and the time is seen by the other component will be slightly different. Which is then in some way reflected in the frequency of oscillation of the normal modes composing the so-called environment. So as a matter of fact, the fact that, as I said before, remember that the molecule is in a superposition of two position eigenstates. This is their work. I'm just describing what they did, nothing new from this point of view. And then the frequency of the environment being this normal mode will be dependent on x1 or x2, on their position. So they will be dilated. So there will be this effect coming into them. Okay? So that's basically the idea behind these things. There is obviously a mathematical derivation of all the equations that, that, that show actually mathematically from the full uh, um, Lagrangian formalism in relativistic what they consider is of course the, uh, a static uh, background, a scalar uh, yeah. field and all the rest. So there are a number of approximations but there is a derivation that leads to a certain description of the Hamiltonian for the total system and maybe if I have uh, I can write down because I think I don't have it uh, in the. Uh, 
uh, here. Okay. You can just write down the, what happens is that there will be basically an interaction Hamiltonian which will have the form, if I describe with H0 the energy of the external degrees of freedom, so it will be just be given by, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Oh, you don't see it. Okay. Okay. It will just have the form of phi x, where this is the um, gravitational potential, uh, H0 over C squared, at the first approximation. So what will happen is basically that you will have a coupling between the center of mass of the molecule and the Hamiltonian, the energy term, describing the internal degrees of freedom um, of, of the molecule itself. Um, <clears throat> which can all be obviously described. Of course, this is just Gx, where G is the gravitation, the acceleration. OK. Now, <clears throat> in order to understand this better, uh, I need to specify what are the assumptions. So one yes. question. In the non-relativistic limit, all these effects disappear? Uh, in the non-relativistic limit, meaning uh, uh, if I take uh, uh, C uh, equal to zero, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. then it disappears. Mm -hmm. Is it infinity? Sorry, to infinity. If I take C equal to infinity, uh, this uh, uh, goes to zero, and this interaction is absent. Uh, it's, it's not there anymore. Okay. So in a way, it is because, the, as I would say here, the main assumptions uh, uh, that are done in the derivation of... Uh, uh, of the master of, the, of, of all the description, the Hamiltonian later on the master equation are, of course, a weak uh, gravitation uh, and very slow particles. So that in principle, you can actually see all of it in terms of uh, mass energy equivalence, really. So you can uh, basically just consider the interaction coming from the fact that if you have the, the, the total mass uh, to be considered is the mass of the molecules pl plus this term, H0 over C squared, which is basically the contribution of the energy uh, provided by the internal degrees of freedom. So, and, and then you just consider that if you, if you have this object where the total mass is mass of the molecule plus this, you will see that the um, gravitation uh, of, the, of this total, uh, when applied to, to, um, mass, to the total mass, will be uh, contributing to the coupling in this way. Okay, so assumptions are weak gravitational field, as I said, and very slowly moving particle, in this case the, the, the whole molecule is slowly mu moving, uh, which is really basically equivalent to Newtonian limit. Another assumption they do is that they consider an asymptotic observer, so the observer observing the decoherence, this will be the aim, is located infinitely far away uh, from the source of, uh, uh, of, um, of gravity and also for the experiment, from the experiment set up. And but finally, something that, okay, in some sense I don't, I'm, I'm not really generally happy with, uh, is the fact that they consider these position eigenstates, which are not really physical states, as we all know. So we wanted uh, to generalize uh, some of, by, by looking at removing some of these assumptions, basically. This was what we did. Uh, what I should say before continuing and introducing uh, my, uh, let's say, our work was that back even, starting from an interaction between system, center of mass, uh, and environment of this form, you can derive a so-called master equation, the equation of motion for the center of mass, okay, which is this form. So this can be derived, making, basically making these assumptions that I mentioned before. You have a unitary contribution, so this is the Hamiltonian, uh, um, so the unitary dynamics, which is the commutator of this modified Hamiltonian term and the density matrix of the center of mass, so this is the unitary part. And then you have some sort of term contributing to the decoherence, actually, driving the decoherence, which is expressed in terms of this double commutator here x, again, remember always this x is always the position uh, operator of the center of mass, okay. it's our system. Um, and in and, uh, and this uh, expression we have that this term is just the mean energy of H0, and they assume uh, that the vibrational modes are in thermal equilibrium 
has a temperature T sufficiently high, so it's a high temperature bath. So bath, well, okay, they are, it's not an infinite number of vibrational modes, but very many. Right? And they are in a, in a thermal state, so this will be something proportional to KBT, as you can imagine. While uh, the fluctuations uh, are just given, well, by definition, by this term, and they will enter into this coefficient. Okay? So in this master equation, you will see that the coefficient uh, of the double commutator, of the operatorial part, depends linearly on time, and it depends on the fluctuations. Uh, because this is a thermal bar, uh, the fluctuations are proportional to, to um, so delta I, delta I squared, uh, delta I not squared is proportional to kb squared t squared. Now we have, and of course there is g and there is c squared. And once again, when c is infinity, this term is zero and you don't have the coherence, basically. Yes? yes. What is a small m here, the mass of the uh, This a small m, thank you. Uh, the small m is the mass uh, of the full uh, object, okay? It's the mass of the molecule itself. Yes? So I'm thinking of this uh, effect, classical effect that that the masses, uh, the masses uh, disappear in the fall in the motion of a, a body. So in, in the gravitational thing, mm -hmm. the geometric. Uh, yes, but that means is here. Case, that this depends on the space. It does, uh, and uh, I mean, consider that uh, at this stage, uh, I mean, they do this assumption. We also do it, uh, uh, but. Well, I could discuss more about it because there is an equivalent with the free folding case. But here, uh, the object is kept. Okay, there is no, it doesn't move. So the, the molecule is stationary. Okay? At a certain, stationary, prepared in a superposition, but stationary with respect to Earth. So it's not a free falling experiment. Different masses would be coherent differently. Different masses would be coherent differently because mass also enters. Actually, well, the important point is that actually the decoherence rate, as you will see it um, soon, really does depend uh, on this term. Okay? Uh, so this is the decoherence rate. Uh, it is, it, this, this enters here and it rules the unitary dynamics, but the decoherence depends on this. And mass enters also here. So in this sense, yes. Uh, mass will depend. Yes. And this, what is the expectation? Is the expectation value of H0? Uh, this H, H0 is uh, uh, the Hamiltonian uh, of the internal degrees of, of the normal modes of the environment. So let me write it down. Uh, so it's here. So each note is just... Uh, sum over k, uh, omega k, v dagger k, b k, okay? So it's, it's um, the, the, the normal mode. Okay? Ah, so the it's the environment. Is also calculated on the row, I mean, it's still a linear equation in the row. Yeah, yeah, it's still a linear equation. This is calculated on the total state. Yes, the yes. The no. Is there, and, and it's because this is, it's also assumed that this is a thermal environment. So it will be, this object is proportional to temperature in the high Okay, so this is what we will call K, this term here, uh, and KT, well, we also define this, this uh, uh, time-dependent decay ray uh, that we call KT, and we just noticed, for those of you used to the uh, quantum uh, non-Markovian dynamics, we just noticed that uh, this term is always positive, so in the uh, quantum uh, uh, non-Markovian sense, uh, this master equation is... Uh, um, does not have uh, um, negative decay rates. Okay. And it is uh, Markovian in the sense of being CP divisible for the community who knows these things. I will be very fast on that, okay? Because this is a um, Lindad-like form with always positive decay rates. So it is a CP divisible dynamics. Okay, so what they study uh, is the so-called interferometric fringe visibility. So they just look at the uh, coherences uh, with respect to the x spaces. So if I define, so V of t is just defined, I don't remember if I have it in the talk, as twice the modulus of rho cm12 uh, of t, uh, where this uh, rho cm12 is just x1 rho center of mass, sorry, x2. So remember x1 and x2 are the two parts of the superposition. Okay, so I have a superposition of the two position eigenstates, and this is just a off-diagonal term. Of the 
manifest this form, and to go briefly, uh, to go uh, quickly, um, what is important for us is that uh, for relatively, let's say, relevant time scales, this interferometric frame visibility decays exponentially. Uh, exponentially okay? So this means that I started with x1 plus x2 superposition, I go to a statistical mixture, in the, because the off diagonal elements are decaying, and I go to uh, this uh, statistical mixture with a, a typical time scale, which is given by this, uh, it's here, but, it, but it's related uh, to, this, um, uh, to this function here, okay? This is that basically I just wrote explicitly the form of the decay rate which appeared before, okay? So this is the time that, um, the, the coherence time uh, showing the transition from a quantum superposition of x1 and x2 to the statistical mix. So yes? Uh, coming back to the present of the mass, uh, this, does, this does not depend on the mass. And um, coming back to the rest, uh, you were talking about the m in the unitary part. So mm -hmm. And this m does not affect the way you hold the, the equation for motion? Ah, yes, you mean that it doesn't, it doesn't appear here. Okay. Yes, you're right. I don't think that the mass is present in the, flat, in the fluctuation. So no, 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 you're right, you're right. This was my mistake. It's I mean, good. It's, a, it's, it's yes. the, the part of the... It's only in the unitary part. You're right. Mass. Yeah, indeed it's here. I just so there's no mass anywhere. Yeah, you're right. I mean, what is, in some sense, uh, what, what, what is the... Uh, what appears here is n, which is the number of the vibrational modes, of the, the total number of quantum harmonic oscillators, the size of the environment, so to say. <laughs> so it's not the mass explicitly, but it's this n uh, number of, of modes. Thank you. I mean, I, I, it's true. And this delta x is the difference in height between x1 and x2. So approximately, this decoherence decays uh, with a decay rate which is this form. It depends on temperature, depends on G, it depends on delta X. So eventually what you will, sorry, I will have to go a little bit uh, faster. But what we need to, uh, at this point, specify is, uh, okay, yes, but what, what, what else can we say? Because there are a number of assumptions are general distance. Uh, and in particular, uh, the somehow, um, uh, generalization we did had to do with the asymptotic observer. So instead of considering a, a, an observer asymptotically far, we want to bring it close to Earth, where the experiment is. Um, the harmonic trap, so instead of considering position eigenstates and superpositions of position eigenstates, we want to uh, consider the case in which the molecule is trapped in harmonic potential and study coherent states, superposition of coherent states. And then um, we want to consider the fact that actually, if you think of the quantum harmonic oscillator, actually there are more than one notions of non-classicality. So what can we say in terms of the non-classicality of this state by introducing other indicators, okay. not just the analog of this interference fringe? Uh, and does the size always matter? Because you see in the um, uh, slide that I showed before, the decoherence time did depend uh, on uh, uh, delta x, okay? And for size, uh, so a, if I have a superposition of x1 and x2, I mean, the size of the cut uh, can be sort of measured or, or quantified in terms of the distance between the two components, x1 and x2. The farther is uh, our, this delta x, so x1 minus x2, the more macroscopic, so to say, is the cut. This is intuitively clear. And this is also what is done in the coherent state description. Okay. So basically, if I have a superposition that is, let's say, one nanometers, or a superposition whose distance in the x1 and x2 component, where delta x is one nanometer, or a superposition where delta x is one meter, I would say that the one meter <laughs> delta x is a bigger cut than the one nanometer um, delta x. And this entered in the, in the previous expression, okay? This was in the decoherence frame. But is it always so? This is the question. And the, and the final question is, uh, can we actually see it? Yes. 
have more cushion when you're talking about the harmonic trap in, instead of the position I can say? So do you mean you just have two harmonic potentials? And Thank you. No. Uh, what I use is just one harmonic potential to confine the molecule. And then I assume that it is possible to create a superposition uh, of uh, coherent states in two different um, um, position of the phase space. Let me make an analog of, uh, for example, with trapped ions. Okay, in trapped ions uh, physics, uh, they did it with one ion. Okay, they took the one ion, um, they cool it down. So there are some vibrations, it's described as a quantum harmonic oscillator, and then they create a superposition of alpha plus minus alpha. So basically, and I'm thinking about something similar. This is not one ion, so this is a complex molecule, but something of this type. Um, if you want later, I can, I can comment on the fact that you can also think in terms of other systems where the, the double well idea would work better. For example, Bose-Einstein condensates. There you can imagine to split the condensate in two different, um, at the bottom of the potential, of a double well potential in this direction. But at the moment, we are just describing classical, not classical, the simple quantum now I'm starting to discuss what we did, and I will try to do it in uh, maybe 15 minutes. I don't know how much time still I have. 20 something. Oh, 20? Oh, if I even have more, I'm happy. Okay, excellent. So I, I can slow down. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's begin with the asymptotic observer, okay? Um, and again, I'm not uh, giving you all the details, although the idea is relatively simple here, okay? So basically what, we, what, they, what was, uh, um, let's say, as, assumed uh, in, in, their, um, in, their, in the paper of uh, Bruckner et al. Is, is that this relation between the proper time and the type of time um, of the experiment. And this corresponds basically to take uh, the matrix, uh, the zero, zero element of the matrix equal to one, uh, while instead it is very simple uh, just to uh, write it in terms uh, of the distance between the observer uh, and uh, the experiment itself, uh, which I uh, indicate as uh, R uh, observable here, with Rs, uh, the Schwarzschild uh, uh, radius. So, of course, you see um, that if you take here uh, the observer to infinity, uh, then this, uh, this um, correction uh, goes to zero, and you will obtain the same, um, the same time, uh, proper time that they uh, introduce uh, uh, in the experiment, okay? Uh, at the same time, another thing that they do and that we, uh, we, we sort of slightly uh, generalized is the um, consideration of, instead of consider considering the form uh, of the uh, matrix linearized in position as this, we just consider the distance um, from Earth, for example, and R is the distance of Earth. And, uh, and this, the metric includes uh, one term more. And if you combine the previous and the second, uh, um, the second um, uh, corrections, you will obtain the, uh, yeah, okay, as I said, R is just the distance, uh, so the radius of, of Earth. If you combine the first and the second corrections, you, you will just obtain that the decoherence time as seen by the, an observable uh, as a distance R from, from uh, Earth. Uh, and the decoherence time with respect to, so the correction um, of, of the decoherence time of the Charles uh, paper and the decoherence time with a, uh, an observer at a finite distance uh, is just given by this, uh, uh, by this ratio. Um, and, and of course here in this ratio, uh, AR and A uh, observable are, are just defined at the square root of one minus RS, and then this is the distance um, uh, from our, uh, of the, distance from the observer. So basically, it's a simple correction, and this correction is absolutely, if you, if you insert here uh, numbers, uh, this correction is really negligible uh, if the experiment is performed close to Earth, uh, but on the other hand, it would become uh, very significant uh, if the experiment is uh, performed close to very massive objects, for example, close to a black hole, uh, in which case you would see uh, that, uh, for example, if the um, distance, um, so that the position of the observer is uh, coincident uh, with the uh, Schwarzschild, I never, I'm not able to pronounce it correctly, radius, uh, this term uh, goes to zero. 
um, which gives me um, basically as a consequence the fact that the decoherence time itself uh, uh, goes to zero. So basically this is simply related to the fact the slowing down of, of time. Uh, so everything freezes in that case. So to summarize, what happens is, uh, is that on Earth the correction due to that finite um, distant uh, observer uh, would be uh, irrelevant, but the correction uh, is dependent uh, on, the, uh, on the mass, obviously, uh, of the source of gravitation. So in some cases, should be considered. Yes. I have a philosophical question. Yes. So, uh, uh, as far as I know, there is no theory that treats on equal footing in all quantum effects mm -hmm. and uh, relativistic gravitational uh, mm -hmm. effects, right? And then you are kind of mixing Schrodinger, Einstein. I mean, does it make sense? Yeah, I mean, it is done consistently. So if you follow um, all the derivations, so the only thing that you do is just to uh, consider, um, well, let me answer in this way. I mean, open quantum system, the, the most, uh, um, if you want, the most um, uh, formally correct way of describing of an open quantum system is absolutely equivalent to quantum field theory. I mean, the environment is a quantum field. The, talking about open quantum system is nothing else than doing quantum field theory and facing the environment. So you're doing here the same, only that this is a current space time. Uh, and of course, you just use the simplest, the lowest order approximation, which gives you the post Newtonian So everything is consistent. Of course, the assumption behind here is the fact that you're, you're considering weak gravitational effects. And there is no, um, or actually, almost stationary motion. Okay? So, I mean, one of the things that I, I believe, uh, despite the fact that there are a number of approximations done, I mean, they are done consistently. I think that one of the contributions that this paper gave is that we generally think that in order to observe some gravitational effects, when you think in terms of quantum mechanics, you have to think in terms of strong gravitational fields and fast, um, fastly moving close to speed of light objects, which is not the case here. So this, this is a weak effect, but it is an effect that arises from the treatment, and you can really do as you would do when you, when you describe a quantum field in terms of space time, you, you consider the time of orientation. It is done consistently, it is correct. So, I mean, the only thing is that, well, it is a very, 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 uh, if you want, uh, low order approximation. So the fact, uh, assumingly, is weak. Uh, but time dilation, on the other hand, has been observed, um, and also in, in quantum systems. So there was a, um, an experiment, I, I believe that the, probably uh, the experimental scenario where this could be more easily observed is uh, was Einstein condensate. Apparently, at the moment, there is within this community a lot of um, uh, interest in uh, uh, making experiments that are able to detect or, or they're able to um, somehow show some relativistic uh, effects within the quantum mechanical scenario. This is, there's nothing to do with the, uh, you know, uh, anything that um, with quantum gravity has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, uh, somehow finding a theory which uh, combines quantum mechanics and general relativity. It doesn't have anything to do with this. Okay? Well, it's well, just quantum field theory. Yeah. Then well, you show interest time. Sorry? You show a picture for the movie. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, that's true. Well, this was like for fun. Yeah. 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 The, the only part of, of the, the mixture of the two theories that doesn't work is when you have superposition. So if, uh, if Earth is met in a position of two, two different positions, then you cannot do the mass. Or if you reach the, the Planck energy or Planck mass or something like that, then you cannot do that. The quantum mechanics in curved space time, or even quantizing the, the gravity in the small fluctuations with respect to a fixed classical metric, this is coming up. So let's say that so the even this case is work, good work. So particles are quantum, but the field is classical. Well, I don't know. That, uh, gravity is a geometrical effect, which is what uh, Einstein uh, mm -hmm. interpretation. And quantum mechanics is, is this uh, solved, or is this, uh, you say that there is no problem in that? But okay, let's say that this is uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting point for this discussion. But maybe yeah. But anyway, I mean, for now, let's say let's be, let's continue. But it is an interesting thing. I mean, this is within the limits. 
I, I'm quite confident to say that the formalism uh, works um, and is consistent. So now um, the issue of the harmonic trap, and maybe I will be um, I will be quite fast here because uh, I want to um, give you some ideas about the other non-classicality indicators at least, and also uh, about the comparison with the observability. So. Uh, the Wigner function description that I introduced before for a cut state um, that is a superposition of alpha plus minus alpha can be written and can be solved in time analytically. So there is an analytical solution describing the time evolution of the Wigner function in this state. And this consists of uh, three terms, uh, a term describing these, this, uh, uh, let's say, components, alpha and minus alpha, and then there is an interference part which describes the evolution of this uh, interference fringe in the center. Okay. Uh, and uh, what we are interested in uh, actually as a quantifier, uh, actually this tradition, uh, this is in the literature really what, what was uh, studied uh, in, uh, in open quantum system, uh, as a quantifier of the decoherence process, uh, is the behavior of the fringe visibility defined as the peak value of the interference fringe normalized with the uh, values, uh, the peak values of the, uh, of the um, uh, two components, alpha and minus alpha. Because you have an analytical solution for these, uh, uh, for these um, dynamics, you can calculate also the fringe visibility dynamics. And this is what uh, you observe. So the fringe visibility, in general, does depend on the size. Please uh, notice that here, in, in the formalism of the quantum superposition of alpha, I have alpha plus minus alpha normalized, um, let's say delta x, so the analog of delta x, which was before x1 minus x2, will be something proportional to, to alpha, okay? the distance between the peak. So if I have a peak here, so this is uh, minus alpha and this is alpha, Twice alpha is the analog of the, different, the, the distance between the peaks. Right? Well. So it does depend on the distance. Also, this means it depends on the size of the cup. The bigger is alpha, the bigger is the cup size. And it depends on one time dependent coefficient only. Okay? This time dependent coefficient uh, can be written uh, in terms of the if you remember, the k was entering in the decay rate of the master equation. It can be written uh, in terms of this uh, uh, coefficient which involves the fluctuations um, uh, of the um, internal Hamiltonian. And of course, this is just simply related to the fact that now we are using this dimensionless um, quadrature as position and momentum operators. So it's just a factor. And once again, if I look uh, at convenient time scales, meaning uh, actually much before thermalization, the uh, interference fringe, so the peak uh, of the interference fringe of the Wigner function, decays with a decay rate, which is once again basically the same uh, as the one uh, given uh, by the uh, Chaslap paper. Okay? So basically, of course, the correction about the asymptotic observer sh still sh needs to be done, but this is independent. I mean, you can always do it. I mean, the two things can be separated. Okay? So the decoherence time has this um, expression, uh, and it is, if you look at the before and after, the two are, uh, are the same. Okay? So the decoherence time, if you consider x1 plus x2 superposition of the eigenstates with Hamiltonian, which is not specified, and the decoherence time, of the interference bridge, the fringe of the of the Wigner function, and they, they coincide. Provided that you define distance, of course, uh, this is what I was saying. So that's the first point. Until now, no surprises. Um, notice what we expect. Um, is precisely verified. So the higher is the temperature, the faster is the decoherence, um, exactly because of this relation between the fluctuations and the temperature, the proportionality itself. So if the bath is, is a high temperature, it will decohere more and faster uh, than the superposition. And of 
of course, the bigger is the cut, the faster is the decoherence because I have a proportionality with the x. Yes? For so me, is this is uh, just a kind of sense the opposite. You have the bar from this multiple so the system is like more random. Could you give some intuition about that? Why, why is it you mean for the temperature uh, yes, perspective? Okay. But because we, uh, a hot bath will be inducing a faster decoherence. So the, the hotter is the bath, the higher is the temperature of the bath, the more sensitive uh, is, the, um, is the decoherence rate. So the, the, more, the faster yeah, it will decohere. If you want to think it in these terms, decoherence generally occurs in this system before, much before thermalization. So it's even time scale wise, uh, it would be something that would happen before normalization. And of course, normalization is, is faster for uh, but everything remaining the same, obviously. But for simple, uh, you know. So it's just that there is more energy. But this is, let me put it in this way. Uh, it is the same as what one expects from environment induced decoherence theory. Um, with quantum harmonic oscillators as above. Um, now we, we quickly go to the many notions of non classicality. Uh, and, uh, and here the issue is uh, okay, fine. This is what we observe when we look at the transition from a quantum superposition to a classical statistical mixture as signaled. Uh -huh by the interference fringe, but what can we say in terms of other definitions of non-classicality? Uh, and we consider four non-classical indicators uh, that have been introduced in quantum optical descriptions, non-classical depth, negativity of Wigner function, Fogel criterion, and Fischer criterion. So there are other ways of defining when a quantum harmonic oscillator or the state of a quantum harmonic oscillator is classical, and we want to see in terms of gravitation-induced decoherence, how these indicators behave. So the, uh, very unwavingly, a way of interpreting physically these indicators, like the non-classical depth, um, will be presented first, and then I will give you the definition. But basically, in a sense, non-classical depth sort of measure the minimum number of thermal photons that are required to destroy any non classical feature, non classical characteristic in the, in the system, and is technically defined in terms of the quantum characteristic functions. And because we are all very tired, I can give you details uh, later, but I will be, uh, I will be uh, just uh, telling you, you know, what, are, what is the result in case of the non classical indicator. It's defined in terms of the p function. You have p function evolving in time according to a certain convolution. And because we do have the time evolution of all the relevant quantity, we can calculate actually the time at which um, this p function uh, of the initial cut state becomes uh, classical according to this criterion. Uh, and this is defined um, in the non-classicality that as the time for which the initial p function evolves into the q function of the, of the system, other ah, characteristic function of the system. It can be calculated analytically. It has this very simple expression with respect to n of t. Uh, and we will, uh, we will see that um, basically um, you can define classical and non-classical state in terms uh, of uh, uh, the, the convolution W of alpha ST. Uh, and the time uh, in which non-classicality is lost, uh, according to this criterion, is now twice alpha the decoherence time defined before. Okay? You can calculate it analytically. This means that because the decoherence time was inversely proportional to twice alpha, uh, this uh, object will not depend on the distance anymore, because twice alpha, two alpha was the distance uh, between the components in size. So uh, the, the first criterion is independent of the size of the cup in the sense that it is independent on the distance uh, between the two components uh, of the superposition. The second criterion is the negativity of the Wigner function. Basically, we look at when the Wigner function becomes completely positive, no, no, completely positive, becomes positive everywhere in this space. Uh, and once again, what we find is that this time is independent of the size. It's related to the previous time according to this, um, to this relation. So also for the Wigner function, 
there is no change in whether or not the, the country is like very big in the sense of the position where you find located or not. When you look at the time in which uh, the bigger function becomes positive. Finally, we, uh, not finally, then we consider the Fogel criterion. Um, this is uh, something that is related to properties of the characteristic function of the quadrature distributions. Um, and uh, it is experimentally friendly because in quantum optics uh, setup can be actually measured. Uh, and it is defined as following. So state is non-classical if, if you look at the quantum characteristic function, uh, then um, this relationship holds. So if you find that there exist values of U and V such that the absolute value of the characteristic function xi1 is greater than 1. And, okay, you can do the math. Once again, you have the analytic solution. You will find that, first of all, there is a dependency on the size, once again, in this case. However, this, this dependency on the size um, will saturate quickly. Um, so the decoherence time, if I call it tau v, will be such, uh, sorry, uh, will be such that although depends on alpha, uh, because the analytic expression depends on alpha, it will, for values of alpha that are increasing, uh, will saturate to a certain um, value. It is the same at the time down, I have a thought on that. And finally, the Klitschko criterion is related to um, uh, photon number probability distribution, so somehow it detects quantum feature uh, of the uh, photon number probability distribution. Also, this one is experimentally friendly. It's just a sufficient condition. Is given in terms of a certain um, inequality involving uh, the photon number, uh, or in this case, phonon number probabilities. And we consider only the first one. Of course, here Pn is just uh, n is the Fox state of the quantum harmonic oscillator considered here, so the uh, energy ion states. Uh, and you can uh, once again find analytical expression because the uh, dynamics is completely analytically solvable for the um, uh, probabilities, uh, and you can verify uh, when this inequality is violated, okay? So eventually, if you look at, the, if you consider the question that we asked before, and you compare uh, the values, oh, sorry, here yeah, they're not very visible, but here yeah, they are, all of them. So if you compare, now if you plot now the decoherence times, so this is the interference fringe, uh, so the uh, fringe visibility. Um, of the Wigner function. Klitschko criterion, Fogel criterion, uh, this is the negativity of the Wigner function and the non-classicality criterion. Uh, this is as a function of the size of the cut, for increasing values of the size of the cut. At least for two of the indicators, the cut size does not matter. They are not sensitive to that. But also for the Fogel case, um, sorry, you don't see the scale, but this is really, okay, zero to, to 15. Um, the Fogel uh, criterion very quickly converges to tau w. Okay, in satellites here. Fifteen um, No, this is this is just uh, dimensionless number. So it's twice alpha. So alpha um, uh, was the so alpha is related. So so twice alpha is the distance. So this is the Wigner function. is a function of alpha in phase space. Uh, and if you want. Um, Modulus alpha squared is related to the mean number of excitations uh, of the quantum harmonic oscillator. And you can see it also in this way. So they're all dimensionless quantities. Um, so it is, it is uh, the more you increase the distance, uh, somehow the higher is the number uh, of excitations you're considering in the quantum harmonic oscillator. But these are dimensionless um, quantities. Just tell you how, how what we use as to quantify the subject. And then you also have a relationship between all the indicators, uh, which is the following. Um, they, they have a strict order relation. Uh, so the, the non classicality uh, due to, um, um, so the non classical uh, depth uh, is the first one we uh, consider. When one neglects, uh, when one compares something else than the decoherence time of the interface. And then because I think I should basically finish uh, now, or almost now, uh, I will just show you uh, the case of the, uh, the results for the classical noise, okay? If we introduce some uh, Gaussian stochastic noise, and we want to know, actually, what, is what happens first? Uh, if I have that my system is subjected to fluctuations, okay? For example, due to some 
magnetic field fluctuations. And I know that this is a Gaussian stochastic noise uh, with the uh, correlation current that is Ornstein Mullenbeck. Quickly, quickly. What you can do is that um, you can model the process, the, the uh, stochastic process, and you can ask what would be the values uh, of the coupling strength and the frequency cutoff such that this would be observable. The time dilation induced would be observable. Because if this classical noise is, is too strong, or is, is strong, generally strong, it will destroy the decoherence faster than the decoherence due to gravitation. So I want to know how, how uh, negligible classical noise should be in order to observe gravitation induced time dilation. Okay. And so I'm making a plot in which I compare, I, 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 I once again, I, I solve the dynamics in presence of the classical noise, and I calculate these times as due to the classical noise. And then I compare the ratio between the decoherence time due to the classical noise and the decoherence time due to gravitation induced time dilation. So I have a plot where I have the ratio between these, these times, classical noise and, and um, gravitation induced time dilation is a function of the noise parameters lambda and gamma. Okay? So it's a contour plot. Okay? It's a contour plot of this ratio between the two uh, decoherence times and lambda and gamma. And what happens basically is that in these, these areas here, this blue, violet, uh, um, light blue um, areas here, and this is the big negativity, they are the regions where classical noise is destroying things faster than gravitational time dilation. And if you look at the axis here, this is 10, 10 to minus 6 uh, in units of omega naught, which is the frequency of the harmonic oscillator. And what you basically will observe is that, to make the story short, you really have to have very, very well isolated systems to observe gravitation-induced time dilation, because otherwise uh, the, the noise, the classical noise, would act much quicker and would destroy quickly everything. You really have to have values of the noise parameters in units of the frequency of the oscillator, which are small, 10 to minus 6. This is much, uh, for example, for the trip diagram experiment uh, of the superposition of alpha plus minus alpha, uh, I think we calculated that the value of noise that they had was 10 to minus 2, the analog of this. One. So, yeah. Okay. So this would mean you don't observe anything. So summarizing, and here I conclude, um, that, uh, so on Earth, or close to Earth, observers, the observer distance doesn't really matter. The correction is negligible, as one should expect. Uh, it would mean, be meaningful closer to a mass, more massive object. And also, some non-classicality indicators are not sensitive to the size of the cut. So in some cases, it's easier um, to, or not it's easier, but it, one should be careful, uh, you know, when, when one thinks in terms of, you know, the bigger is the size of the cut, the faster is the decoherence, which is also almost a paradigm in the environment in this decoherence, uh, one should be careful of what actually is the quantum property that is lost. Okay? Uh, and then, um, very often, when, again, gravitation and use decoherence is something that very often is masked by other uh, processes of uh, inducing the coherence but other sources of noise. So this is basically uh, everything that I wanted to say and I will just want to go to the I will skip everything of the future and I want to conclude with thanks. Oh it's, it's gone. <laughs> but anyway <laughs> yeah. 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 I was thinking of the size of the molecule, which in the in the equations for the first part of the, the talk appears as n, the number of moments. Mm -hmm. And I was happy because of it. my concept n and the concept delta x, the only the combination they always appear in the combination n delta x. Mm -hmm. In that example, it was the same. Large molecule or large distance of separation has the same effect. But then you jump to the yeah. cup and then I lose the n. Yeah, there is a uh, very good point. Yes, 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 yes. That's, that's a very good point. I mean, I used, uh, let's say, my criticism on the definition of size is the criticism of the definition of 
size of the uh, quantum optics literature. Because in the quantum optics literature, including the experiments of Sergio Roche and so on and so forth, the size of the cut, when the cut is alpha plus minus alpha, the size of the cut is this. And this is, uh, comes from the fact that if you look at uh, uh, the environment induced decoherence theory uh, by uh, Zurek, this is what he calls the size of the cut. This is what people call the size of the cut. Now, of course, the size of the cut has to be something which is defined in what you call the open system. It cannot be defined in the environment. When you talk in terms of n, remember this n, the number of uh, oscillators? This is part of the environment. So it quantifies the size of, of the environment, if you want, not the size of the well, state I of the, of the I system. I so probably you're right, but this sounds to me very very artificial in the case of the molecule. Okay, you can yes. say that the center of mass is the system and the rest is the, is the, the other, but I think everything is a molecule, so I uh, yeah, yeah. the size of the system. I mean, the, the, the thing is that, that uh, everything is based on, but for this I would, uh, I would agree on, uh, on this formalism, because the point is when you do open quantum system theory, I mean, the starting point is what I call the system and what I call the environment. It's a splitting between system and environment. Then everything, all the conclusions should be consistent with this splitting. So if I call the system the quantum harmonic oscillator which describes the center of mass position, then this is my system. Okay. If I prepare a non-classical state of my system, I'm preparing a non-classical state of the quantum harmonic oscillator which is my system. Okay. Then all the rest, you know, then I formalize what the environment is, how big it is, and, and so on. But I, I have to be consistent with what I chose as the system, what I chose as the environment. And here the non-classicality is just the non-classicality of the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is this degree of freedom. I mean, it's an implementation, of course. Uh, that let, let, let me face yeah. my, my question. I want to see in your formulas for the harmonic lab, what is the, the dependence on M, the mass of the particle of the harmonic lab? Yeah, OK. It's, it's, this was the other thing. Is this the same as alpha, or is completely different? I no. can call the size of the system M. Uh, well, the N, 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 uh, M, mass. like the mass. Okay. No, when it comes to the mass, uh, the observation, uh, what, what uh, Fernando was saying is right. Like M, like the mass of the total object, does not enter into the decoherence rate. Yeah, yes. It's, the uh, so the decoherence rate depends. Yeah. But remember here that this, this okay, I think that this is important. I will put it there and then I will tell you. Because remember here that what you call quantum, or the quantumness that you are. Uh, 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 okay, the okay, this is also another important point. <laughs> okay. You're both right. I was remembering well, right, and you were remembering right as well, because there is an issue. Okay. Okay. So, let's see. Uh, where is it? Oh. Yes, it's here. Okay. Yes, it's here. So this is this in this sense, M does not appear uh, here explicitly in the decoherence style. Okay. Now. Um, this is related, I mean, in a way, consider that here, both, so the coherence is induced by this environment, which is the normal modes, okay? Which, the thing which induces the coherence are the normal modes, this I show. And the mass is the mass of everything, system and environment, is the mass of the total object, okay? So, the lo loss of quantumness uh, is the loss of quantumness of the center of mass only, okay? So it, I don't know how to explain, but you, you need to define something which is related to the properties of this degree of freedom only, not on the environment as well, somehow. So, um, it's not that M, M, M contains both, it's the mass of both the system and the environment. It's the mass of the composite system. So, I, I don't know how to... But, I, but there is one thing that I can also say, and I will be fast. So these observations about uh, um, the coherence time and dependent on the size, so to say, are absolutely independent on the physical implementation here. I mean, 
if you have a quantum harmonic oscillator be linearly coupled with even an infinite number of quantum harmonic oscillators, and I can talk about even photons here. I can talk about the experiments of Sergio Roche are microwave photons. There is no mass. Okay? If you have a, an abstract Hamiltonian total description, which is quantum harmonic oscillator interacting with the infinite number or finite number of quantum harmonic oscillators be linearly, then you, how do you define the mass? How do you define the size? There is no such mass explicitly. Well, what are the estimates for this? time in the experiments with these gigantic molecules uh, I think somebody has done it and I don't remember it I mean there are these uh, people have done calculations uh, they are, um, they are the problem is I think even in the Chaslav uh, paper but they are long they are seconds okay so they are long the, the reason why the difficulty is precisely that they are long <laughs> they're not that they are short because they are the decoherence times are so long Actually, what happens is that um, you have to be very, very well isolated because any other source of noise will be much faster. Seconds, uh, it's, a, it's a long time when it comes to other sources of noise. That's the problem. Okay, so we conclude here. Let's thank Sabrina again. Thank you.